Welcome back to Equity Tutors. Today we're going to be finishing off a couple of topics um, which we have left over from previous lessons that maybe hasn't been applicable to all exam boards. So I'm going to point out when relevant if it's only applying to one certain exam board or whether that's going to be going to be for all of you. I'm going to start off with something that is applicable to everyone and that is data interpretation, so calculating means, averages, standard deviations, and how we interpret the, those results. And that is a really common exam question um, and is bound to come up on um, at least one of the exam papers. And then I'm going to move on uh, more to diversity, natural selection, use of modern technology in, in establishing diversity, natural selection over time. And that's where it's going to get specific to each exam board. So starting with data interpretation. So you all need to understand what a mean is, how to calculate a mean, and then how to interpret that mean. And similarly, you also need to know how to interpret a standard deviation. And in some cases, you also need to be able to calculate the standard deviation. So what is a mean? So a mean value is what is usually meant by an average in biology. And we calculate the mean or the average by taking the sum of all the measurements and dividing that by the number of measurements. So if you take the height of three people and you want to work out the average height of those three people, you add up their total height. So say five foot eight plus six foot two plus five foot two, add all that together and then divide it by three to get the average value. So what kind of problems can occur when you are just looking at the mean or interpreting the data from a mean or an average? So one of the most common examples is that you have a data point which is possibly too high or too low and we call this an outlier and this can cause the average to be non-representative of the data you saw. So if we think back to the analogy I just used of measuring someone's height, imagine we had a fourth person into that mix and that fourth person is eight feet tall or conversely, three foot tall. If we work out an average of the now four people, what's going to happen is that it's going to skew either way. So with the tall person included, the overly tall person included, what's going to happen is we would get an average that is much higher than the average of the population in general. And we call that an outlier. And that is something to be aware of if you are given any data in an exam where they ask you to calculate a, a mean or an average, you calculate that mean and they could ask you, for example, what is the problem with just looking at a mean alone? Or they might even ask you to find the outlier in the data they have given you and explain why that outlier shouldn't be included in the calculation of the average. And the mean is also sometimes referred to as an X with a line on top in calculations. Calculations such as the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is a type of way of looking at the variance in the data. So the mean itself is more informative as a statistics when it's provided alongside the standard deviation. And what the standard deviation is telling us is, that, is what the spread of the data is around the mean. So it's a very useful tool of looking at the spread of the data or how much variation there is in the data. So I'll give you another example. So you have a group of uh, 50 people of all different ages and you work out the average age of that group. So if you took a uh, representative sample subset of the whole population, you'd maybe expect the average age to be 40. However, if you took a group of um, uh, 50 people in, for example, an office, you're gonna, you may end up with the same average of 40, 
but the variance in that data is going to be much smaller than if you were looking at a whole population. So the standard deviation of the average when we were looking at the whole population is going to be larger. But if we are just looking at the average age of an office worker, the variation is going to be smaller because people who work in an office are only going to be typically aged between 20 and 60 years old. So we still get the same average age if we're if looking at people in an office as we do the whole population but the variance of the data is much smaller so the standard deviation is going to be smaller for the office workers comparing to the whole population so adding the standard deviation alongside the mean gives you more of an idea of the data set as a whole just as a quick indicator so you may be asked in an exam to calculate the standard deviation and I advise for your specific exam board to look at whether or not you need to know the equation to calculate the standard deviation. It's a pretty simple equation but I do advise you just check to know whether you need it or not because you, if you don't need to learn it and it's provided for you in an exam it's just one less thing to worry about. So you need to know before going into calculating the standard deviation, you need to know the average. So that is the one input you definitely need. And you also need to know the sample size. So looking at the equation to calculate standard deviation. So firstly, we have the symbol that means the sum of, so that just means the total. And that is the total of the actual observation. So the data they provide minus the mean that you have calculated squared over n which is the sample size number minus one and so you just plug in the numbers that they would provide plus the mean that you were likely have, to have calculated yourself as well into the equation and get the standard deviation and the way that that is presented in, this, in an exam is that you have the mean and then you put a plus slash minus the standard deviation Again, I recommend that you go over a couple of these questions. It sounds simple enough, especially if you are doing maths at A level as well. But just do a couple of exam practice questions where you just work through completely from getting the data that they provide, to working out the mean, to working out the standard deviation. And for some of you as well, you may need to know about student t-tests. So just very briefly, but I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail, some of you may need to know how to compare two different means. But we will at some point be doing a maths specific revision lesson. But just for those of you who are thinking about whether I'm going to mention t-test in this lesson, I'm not. I just want to cover the basics of mean and standard deviation. Okay, so for the rest of the lesson, I'm going to go back to the diversity and natural selection modules. So for some of you, um, this will be minimal new information that you need. Some of you, there'll be a little bit more. So I just want to start with talking about uh, diversity in general and the way that we measure different um, types of diversity, which I have explained in my previous lesson. But now I want to focus more on the genetic ways and the modern technology that we can use to track evolution over time. So you need to be able to appreciate that there have been advances in what we call genome sequencing. So that is looking at the sequence of our DNA and being able to use that, for example, to compare our DNA to our um, closest animal ancestors, such as monkeys, to see the differences and similarities between our DNA and plot that um, in evolutionary terms, which is something I have went over in my last lesson. And that is known as molecular phylogeny. So for the most of you, that is all you need to understand, that modern technologies, particularly in sequencing and genetics, have helped us recategorize the majority of organisms. But for some of you, you need to know specific examples of those modern technologies. So EdXLB, um, in particular, you need to know about gel electrophoresis, as do, to a lesser degree, WGJC and uh, CIE. Again, I recommend you look specifically at your syllabuses 
um, but I am just going to go through gel electrophoresis for now for those three exam bones only. So this is an example of a technique used in molecular phylogeny um, and has helped us to be able to compare the DNA between different species. Gel electrophoresis is a technique used widely to analyse DNA and RNA. And what you can do with electrophoresis is that the molecules are separated according to their size or mass. And this separation occurs because the DNA is negatively charged because of its phosphate group and will move down the electrical field quicker towards the anode. So different size molecules will move through the gel at different rates. So the tiny pores within the gel results in smaller molecules moving quickly with larger molecules moving slowly. So the smaller fragments will be at the bottom of the gel. And this can be used specifically to separate DNA and used for genetic profiling or fingerprinting. So what you can do is to digest DNA using known digestion sites which may or may not be common between for example family members different species etc use these common sites to digest the dna break the dna up into different pieces and compare the bands that you get from gel electrophoresis so and how that physically works is that you use an agarose jelly and you make wells at the top of that jelly where you are able to load in your DNA. So you put the DNA fragments which have been cut with restriction endonuclease enzymes. And these are the enzymes that I just mentioned. They cut at specific sites in the DNA. So maybe I personally have a um, very unique restriction site um, that an enzyme could cut in my DNA and I wanted to figure out whether that came from my mother or my father. Um, what you could do is take the DNA of all three of us, digest with that, with that enzyme, run the DNA and see which pattern my mother's or my father's is more similar to mine and that would tell me, okay, I got this piece of DNA, this restriction site from my mother or my father. So how does that physically work? So you prepare an agarose gel. As I said, that is, um, it's just a gel substance where DNA can move through. And you load the DNA fragments that have been digested already by these restriction endonuclease enzymes into the wells of those gels. And you also include with the DNA a dye so that afterwards you can visualize where the bands are. And then you, what you do is turn on a current. So you have the gel in a tank, turn a current on. So the, the tank is full of a liquid that is able to contact, conduct a current. And then what happens is that you can see the DNA, since it is negatively charged, it moves towards the anode at the bottom of the tank. And then once it gets to the bottom, you turn the current off and you can visualize the pieces of DNA on a UV light. And so different bands represent different sequences of amino acids and can be compared to known fragments. This technique can also be used for, for example, identifying DNA left at crime scenes. So in this case, what's done is that um, the restriction endonuclease enzymes target known variable regions in DNA. So regions that we know are completely different in all people. So instead of looking at similarities, we're looking at how does the DNA cut differently, but that is specific to an individual person. And then what you do is perform the gel electrophoresis compared to the DNA sample, for example, found at a crime scene, and see whose DNA cuts to the same pattern as that DNA found at the crime scene. So that is one example of a technique that has um, very much helped pro progress scientific uh, knowledge on both evolution um, and diversity. Um, as well as that, there's DNA sequencing. This is where we look at the whole sequence of the DNA and bioinformatics. And then 
finally, you need to know about how then the scientific community is able to share their findings. So it's no good if a scientist is sitting on a load of data that they know is really important and other scientists should know about. What's important is that that is shared and lined up with the other knowledge that other scientists have. And the way that that is done is the publishing in scientific journals. And this is a peer-reviewed system. So for scientists submit their work to a peer-reviewed journal, that journal then contacts experts in that field to analyse that work, give feedback to the scientist, and they um, can then answer those questions before that work is officially published. And they also pre uh, present at scientific conferences. They present like oral presentations or poster presentations to speak to experts in the field at that conference for constant feedback and collaboration. Okay, now I'm going to go back to talking about evolution in general. And specifically, this next um, part is for those of you studying under the OCR exam board. So you should all understand by now how evolution occurs. And for OCR, you just need to have a little bit more understanding of the type of adaptations that occur during evolution and how they are categorised natural selection or evolution can sometimes come about when species are competing with each other and competition occurs in what we call a niche. So the niche of a species is its role within the environment and so when two species are existing in the same niche what can happen is that there is competition and then when one species is better adapted to that niche than the other we get natural selection. So as I said, you need to know some examples of types of adaptations that can occur in evolution. So the first is an anatomical or physical adaptation. This is, as you imagine it would be, an either external or internal presence of um, a physical change in the animal that has resulted in that animal having an advantage over um, another individual. So an example of this is the presence of the loop of Henle um, in the kidneys. I wouldn't worry about this yet if you haven't reached that part of your studies. But essentially, in desert animals, this meant that they were able they were able to produce more concentrated urine to minimize water loss. Another type of adaptation is a behavioural adaptation. So this isn't, for example, a giraffe with a long neck being able to reach higher trees. What this means is that um, an animal has adapted behaviourally. So perhaps it's learned to uh, communicate with others in this pack when there is a predator near. So there is a behavioural change. Another example would be mating calls. So they've learned to communicate with each other to have a better chance of generating a successful offspring. And then finally, we have physiological adaptations. So these are processes inside the organism's body. So different to a physical adaptation, physiological adaptation is, for example, it's better able to regulate its uh, temperature or by um, regulating blood flow through the skin, which also means it's able, it's better adapted to live in, in different types of climates, maybe with extreme weather, that means it's more likely to survive in that environment. And then the next thing you need to know is some evidence or how the initial evidence for evolution and natural selection was initially collected. And I'm sure many of you, many of you have heard of Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin and many of the scientists' observations have provided evidence to the theory of evolution. As I said earlier in this lesson too, this has now been doubly proven by um, genetic testing and more advanced techniques to look at genes. But what Darwin did was that he observed many different types of finch on the Galapagos Islands. And he believed that they must be related because they had so many similarities. So although they seemed to be different species, there was a lot of crossover in many of the characteristics. He concluded a bone 
a bird born with a beak was more suited to the food available, would be more likely to survive than those whose beak was less suited. So those that survive would pass the trait on to their offspring and over time all the finches in the area would share the same shape of beak. So what we now know as natural selection. And then the second person you may not have heard of is Alfred Wallace and he did a uh, very similar ideas to Darwin and they actually published the theory together. Although Charles Darwin became the more famous one, he did actually work with this second scientist called Alfred Wallace. So what are the actual physical um, pieces of evidence that we now have for evolution? So firstly, we have fossils. So this is just looking at the remains of extinct organisms, comparing them to those alive today. So for example, looking at um, the existence of cavemen, knowing that we evolved from cavemen, but they now no longer exist because of natural selection. In things like rocks, you can actually date them to give a, a bit of a timeline of when those species previously existed. Again, we have molecular biology, looking at the similarities and differences between DNA sequences. We have comparative anatomy, so comparing the anatomy of different organisms by looking at homologous structures, that just means similar structures. For example, um, again using humans and monkeys as an example, monkeys may have fingers but don't necessarily have the full um, dexterity in hands that humans have, suggesting we evolved after um, certain species of apes but that we generally come from the same branch of the phylogenic tree. Um, we look at variation, so each population shows natural variation in characteristics and each characteristic varies in either a continuous or discontinuous fashion. What do I mean by discontinuous? So discontinuous is a variation where there's no intermediates, so it means there's an absolute value. Something like what colour are your eyes? Uh, most people either have blue, brown or green eyes. So that is a discontinuous variation. And these characteristics are usually something controlled by a single gene, which is why they are more absolute. A continuous variation is when a characteristic can take any value within a range. So for example, height, weight, etc. And you also need to know how these types of data are presented differently in different graphs. So if you have a discontinuous variation, so you've look, you're looking at the eye colour of 100 people, you would want to represent that kind of data on a bar chart. So you can separate them into three groups. However, if you have a continuous variation, you want to use a histogram. So... What that means is that you can show the total spread of someone of a population's height and that would typically have what we call a normal distribution, meaning that there is the majority of people in the middle but then you'll have a uh, smaller and smaller population who are getting taller and a smaller and smaller population that are getting shorter. And these types of characteristics, continuous ca characteristics, uh, conversely to the discontinuous and normally controlled by more than one gene. So there's more than one thing influencing someone's height and also often influenced by environmental factors. So finally I am going to move on to the last piece of uh, information that we need and this is just for students studying under edXLA. Um, and continuing in the uh, evolution theme. So uh, edXLA, you also need to understand the concept of a niche. So a niche is the, a niche of a species is its role within the environment. So what specific thing does that species bring to the environment? And furthermore, you need to understand how new species are formed. So in this process called speciation and how there are different types of species. Uh, how speciation can come about. So if two populations become reproductively isolated, a new species will be formed. So I'll just explain what I mean by that sentence. So if within one species, 
the two groups form and they are reproductively isolated, mean that, meaning they no longer can reproduce to produce fertile offspring, new species will be formed. So this is due to the accumulation of different genetic information in populations over time due to potentially different environments and selection pressures. And this is called speciation. So imagine for some reason half the world become cut off from the other half of the world and over time the selection pressures in the two halves of the world were very different. Think of the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. That there is a change in the environment in those two parts of the world. Over time they will genetically start to drift apart. They will become more diverse and it is possible that down the line in hundreds and hundreds of years that the two populations and the two uh, parts of the world would no longer be uh, able to reproduce with one another and in that situation we now have two different species so that is an example of speciation and speciation can be allopatric and that is where the isolation is geographic so in the example I've just used or sympatric. So this is a different type of isolation. So uh, it, it can be isolation because of time, behavioral, etc. So for example, if some of the population um, become, so if half the population became nocturnal, this would be an example of a sympatric speciation caused by a temporal difference. So half the population are now not available around to at the same timeline awake at the same time of day to be able to interact with the other half of the population and that can also lead to speciation. And then finally you need to know an example of an ongoing evolutionary race. So what is something that we can actually in real time currently look at the, its evolution and that is the relationship between antibiotics and bacteria so bacteria are able to as pathogens are able to evolve adaptations which enable them to survive and reproduce and ev evade the toxicity of antibiotics and we call this antibiotic resistance and it is present in the population due to mut mutations and what happens is the antibiotics kill all the non-resistant bacteria so 99% of the bacteria in your body this removes the competition for the resistance resistant bacteria which survive reproduce and pass on the resistant alleles to their offspring eventually leaving a completely resistant uh, population so an example of this is MRSA which you may have heard of and this was a bacteria that developed in hospitals where patients were being treated with antibiotics and exactly as I just explained they, uh, the antibiotics doesn't kill 100% of the bacteria. You have a, pop, a diversity in the population of bacteria causing the infection as you would in diversity in any population. And it's possible that a few of the bacteria that infected the body have a mutation which may mean that they are immune to the bacteria resistance. But obviously what we are doing is applying a huge selection pressure to that population, which means that the resistant bacteria have a big advantage and are the only ones to survive. And then when the, bac the bacteria is passed on maybe to another person, what happens is that the bacteria that's passed on is now likely to have that uh, resistant gene because the bacteria the antibiotics have killed all the um, bacteria that is going to be killed by the antibiotic and finally you need to know a, a an equation called the hardy weinberg equation so the hardy weinberg equation can be used to estimate the frequency of alleles in a population to monitor the change in allele frequency so this is another case where you are given an equation, you will be given the data and you just need to fill in the data that you're given into the equation and get a number. Of course you need to know how to interpret that data but it is mostly a practice exercise.
but I will go through the equation anyway. So the equation has uh, a few different inputs. So firstly, P, so this is the frequency of the dominant allele. This will be present, present, represented by a capital letter. And then Q is the frequency of a recessive allele, which will be represented by the smaller letter or a, small, a big A and a small A. Um, and essentially what this equation says is that the frequency of all of these alleles is going to equate to one. So if you consider all the different combinations of uh, allele combinations you can have, so a dominant and a recessive, a double dominant, double recessive, they will all equal to one or 100% of the population. So then if we know the frequency of one of the alleles, we can use that to work out the frequency of the second allele. So I'm going to give you an example. So if in a population of 100 individuals, there'll be 200 alleles because every individual has two versions of each gene. If I say that 120 of those alleles were the dominant allele, then the frequency of the dominant allele is 120 over 200. So it's essentially the same as working out a percentage. So 120 divided by 200 is 0 0.6. So if we know that the 0 0.6 is the dominant allele, then we can work out from knowing P plus Q or uh, from P plus Q equals 1 or 100% that the amount of Q or the recessive allele will be 1 minus 0 0.6, which is equal to 0 0.4 or 40%. So that is how you work out the frequency of the allele, but you can also use it to work out the frequency of the genotype. So as I said, P squared will be the dominant homozygous alleles, Q squared will be the recessive homozygous, and 2PQ will be the heterozygous. And again, all of these are going to equal to 100% of the population. So if you know from the first example I gave you, the values for P and Q, you can use these to plug into the second equation, looking at the frequency of genotypes, not just of alleles, using this more complex um, equation and work out the um, allele and then the genotype frequencies as well. And as ever, I recommend that you go through these examples many a times these can be a little bit confusing so I recommend doing many examples and then finally there are some conditions to the Hardy-Weinberg equation so obviously not every model is this perfect not um, so some of the conditions are that there are no mutations present that there is a large population that the population is isolated that there is no selection pressure and that there is random mating so thank you so much for listening remember you can access additional content on our patreon page by searching for equity tutors where we have a second 30 minute lesson every week plus monthly bonus content. You can also find us on most social media platforms. We will keep you updated on new content and you can find us there by searching for Equity Tutors UK. Please like, share, subscribe and comment wherever you are listening and if you're enjoying, please leave a review. Bye! Bye.